it out while we talk. But I'll be screen sharing my screen later. So if you want to just look at my screen, that's okay also. So I'll be covering a couple of like topics that I want to talk about first before we move on to looking at the works in the easy. So firstly of all, um, what is Doskin Red, right? So what happened is that Doskin Red is this e-zine that is fully online and it's free. And honestly, I was going to make a zine during the COVID-19 period, but then um, I couldn't really go out, so I couldn't really access printing shops. And also I wanted something online so that people could actually look at it, because if I did print my own zine, then how am I supposed to pass it to you? So I decided to make it online. And since it was online, I thought, oh, okay, I might still have more mediums. Because uh, for a print zine, right, you're basically limited to what can be shown on paper. But if it's online, then you can include things like videos and music, which is what I did. Um, so yeah, I wanted to just do anything that could be supported by a website. Actually, I was considering doing a blog. Like every day for the month of April and May, I decided to do a different thing every day, which means that I would have eventually done 60 different things, none of which would be repeated. But that was pretty hard because I had to do both the zine and the blog. So uh, I decided against it, but maybe I will go back and make that blog. But yeah, because I was like, hmm, since it's online, I could literally just tag anything. So I wanted people to really just run wild with their creativity and do anything they wanted during circuit breaker period. Honestly, there wasn't any submission requirements for this scene. Like you could literally have submitted a video of yourself making Dalgona coffee and I would have been like, content. But yeah, so the theme words for this zine are red, alarm, and isolation. Although you don't necessarily have to deal with those topics, uh, these words will be useful in case you want some kind of direction or in case you want to think about brainstorm what would go well with the zine. So um, the purpose of this zine was to allow like creative people like us to like get together and battle boredom while we socially distance ourselves during the COVID-19 crisis. And it's an outlet for us to express how we feel. Because I thought that, okay, first of all, some people were really bored during circuit breaker. So I wanted to give you some kind of motivation to actually be productive and produce creative content. But on the other hand, I think that being creative actually lets you relieve your boredom, but also lets you express how nervous or anxious you feel every day reading the news. Or also maybe if you feel lonely because you can't see your significant other, then you can use this as an opportunity to write about it, draw about it, like create something that lets you express how you feel. And then I'll just give you a platform so you can put it up there for people to see. Yay. So why Doskin Red? like the name. So basically, uh, during the period of time when I made this zine, we were in Doskin Orange, if I'm not wrong, and everyone was like, oh, it's not a matter of if, but when we're going to move to Doskin Red. And I was like, I mean, I was really scared because, you know, it's a pandemic. And the last time there was a pandemic, it was SARS and I was just a baby. So I don't really have any memories of that. So it was pretty hard to cope because I'm quite naturally paranoid. So I'll be like, someone sneezes in my ear, I'm immediately just like scared for my life. But yeah, so I wanted to do my zine on Doskin Red because I thought it represented our fears during this season. Like kind of, it's not a matter of like, like you worry about whether you will get the virus, but also you don't really know what's going to happen in the days up ahead. So it's kind of like the feeling of the unknown, the fear of the unknown, except it's more of, you think bad things are actively going to happen to you in the near future and you just don't know when. Yeah. So that's why I did on Doskin Red. Also, the color red usually is used to represent passion or like anger and stuff like that. But in this case, red will be used to represent fear, which I thought was more of a green or perhaps gray word. So green and red are kind of like opposites. So I wanted you to like, I wanted people to maybe like represent their feelings in like a color because I thought that would be easier and more like visually appealing. Yeah. Also, um, panic buttons are red. Yeah, like just why the cover of the e-zine is like a Doskin red. Like it's a fire alarm because it's red. But it also like shows how 
we are really alarmed in general by the situation because, you know, we're just generally terrified. Yeah. Um, the contributors. Yeah, it's not just my friends, even though all of you watching are kind of my friends. And even if you're not, you are my friend now. But yes, it's not just my friends. There are also international audiences because I put the link on Twitter for people to contribute and people actually did. Like, I have no idea who they are, but thank you for contributing. Also, some of you are strangers. And also, I got my... Uh, my high school teacher, Mr. Chang, to contribute. So that was also pretty cool. So it's not just teenagers, it's also adults. I mean, there's one adult. Well. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, the reason why I started this zine. Um, it's actually like, there's like a story behind it. But what happened was that I was sleeping and I had a dream. And in this dream, I made the Dawson Red Easy. Except in my dream, uh, it was a website, but it was, had a book on it. So uh, whenever you wanted to flip to like the next page, like the book would animatedly flip and then it would show you the next work. Unfortunately, I didn't really know how to do that. So I just did a regular Wix website with a free membership. But if anyone would like to perhaps animate that book, yes. Yeah, so I dreamt about it and then I woke up and I was like, but it doesn't have to be a dream. It could be real. So I did that. So what happened was I texted all my friends and asked them if they were interested in contributing. Partially also because I wanted to commit myself to it. Because I knew that if I told people about it, then I would naturally feel pressurized to live up to the expectations. And then I wouldn't end up abandoning this project halfway through. And I mean, it worked because we now have 31 contributors. Yay! That's pretty great. Honestly, I was expecting like maybe five people, including me, but y'all came through. I'm proud. Okay. <laughs> so, um, the process of the easy, right? So basically it was my first time ever making a website. I know some of you have probably had some kind of website experience because your school made you, but I had none. And I'm also pretty bad with technology. I am learning and trying my best, but when I first started, I was pretty bad. Like I spent one hour accidentally crashing the website and trying to press buttons to make sure it worked. But then eventually I got the hang of it. So yeah, that's how I started, you know, making really fast edits. Like you guys would send me your piece and I would immediately edit to the side. Character progression. But yeah, so how, how the process of the zine was basically like this. First of all, you have to write out like a message that you can send to people to invite them to contribute. Um, so that would mean like you need to list out the deadlines, you need to set the mood of the entire project. So like, what are you accepting? Are there any submission requirements? That kind of stuff. And also, what are the theme words of the piece? Right, so you need to give people details so that they know how to contribute. And also, you need to be able to be fluent enough in your thoughts and make sure that everything is kind of finalized so that once you send it out, you don't have to retract and eat back your words. So after you send out that message, you just find, oh yeah, don't send it in a group chat. Like, unless there are only three of you or four of you, don't send your promotional message in a group chat because no one will reply. I'm serious. Like, you have to personally go and message everyone. Like, that's my strategy. You just kind of like, slide into as many DMs as you want and go, hello, beautiful person, I'm making a zine, would you like to contribute? And then like, because you're personally approaching them, they feel that maybe you thought of them, I mean, which you did because you actually messaged them, which is true. So they feel like, oh, I am actually personally receiving an invitation. It's not just a group invitation because sometimes, you know, uh, as with me, I'm insecure. If someone sends an invitation to a group, I automatically assume like, Oh yeah, this is for all the other cool people in the group chat, but not me. Because, I don't know, it's like, you just don't feel that it was for you targeted specifically. So you should just approach them and also it's easier for them to ask you questions. Because if it's just between the two of you, then they don't have to worry about uh, looking confused in the group chat. 
Yeah, so after you send a promotional message, after that you start to receive maybe submissions near the deadline, which is when you have to start actually reminding people that there's a deadline. Like this is very important because if I hadn't reminded people about the deadline, they would have forgotten. And then afterwards they would just go, oh yeah, I was going to submit, but the deadline is over. So I just did not, which is why you need to go, you get an extension. So basically when you set the first deadline, you actually have to set it earlier than what when when you need the final product by so for example right the this easy launch is on 30th of august but you can't set the deadline for submissions to be like a week before that because first of all you need time to make the website secondly of all you need time to give people extensions so that you can remind them about three times that you know even though they would love to contribute and they are actually halfway through writing it they have to finish it and submit it so yeah, my, I set my deadline for 30th of May, but uh, honestly, I got submissions all the way up until this month. Yeah, also because um, I had around 27 contributors and I really wanted to hit 30, but then I may or may not have overshot and now I have 32, but that's not a bad thing. That's wonderful. I love all 32 of you. But yeah, so after you send out your so after you receive submissions, you have to start editing them. So um, the way I edit is actually quite broad because I don't have a specific mood of the entire website. I kind of just want to have a compilation of pieces that people did. I don't really have a certain direction like, oh, if you chose to go with this, like perhaps a certain like style, I would just not question it. I'll be like, great, that sounds good because you put in effort and it's very hard to be productive during circuit breaker. I know this because I spent one month doing absolutely nothing. But then I was productive for the other two months where I was doing that one thing every day project. So it makes up for it, you know? Two months of productivity, one month of absolute being a slug. Yeah. So um, yeah, yes, I did people's pieces. So what I did was mainly I checked for grammar because that is important. Unless you are trying to be incoherent on purpose. Like I suspect one of the pieces did because there were like, I think she was talking, the speaker kind of went slowly insane in the piece. So I assume that, you know, because you're going insane, your grasp of the language will naturally slacken. So I just didn't edit that much on that one. But in general, I think I tried to aim for at least a grammatically correct piece. Then afterwards, I will also check out for swear words because this is a safe for work site. You know, it's something you can scroll when you're on the toilet or in public. So yeah, it's safe for work. There are no swear words. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, there's no gore, violent, or smart. There's a little bit of death sprinkled, but nothing too graphic because, you know, it's Dawson and Red, we're poets, we're artists. We're going to write about death. Like, it's love, death, sex, you know, but no sex this time. Yeah, so after you edit the pieces, you... Uh, you start to actually have to make the website. So this is where I had actually procrastinated making the website because I was insecure about my technological abilities and didn't want to be confirmed that I didn't have any. But I actually did end up making a website within two days. So mayhaps and of course, but yes. Um, so after you make the website, what happens is you need to figure out, you need to mentally visualize the layout of the site. Because once you actually start like putting things in, for example, if I had decided that every single piece had its own page, could you imagine the chaos? Like if I eventually decide to streamline everything into one page, I'll have to undo everything and then redo it back. So you need to kind of figure out what your layout is first before you start doing it so that you don't have to extract everything and then put it back because that's really tough. Also, I realized that Wix had different versions for desktop and mobile. So I finished the desktop site and then I was like chilling and vibing. And then someone was like, hey, why is it acting all wonky on my phone? And I was like, right. So I had to go and do that. Yes. So you need to make sure that you're, fam you're rather familiar with the website so you can find things when you need to. Because sometimes people will be like, Hi, I know it's submitted already, but here's the updated version. And then you have to go and scroll and find it back and then like change it. And you also need to make sure that your font and colors are coherent. So what for me is that I really wanted this red and white polka dot background. You'll see it later. 
if it gets a bit annoying, I'm sorry, but that's also kind of the point because circuit breaker is annoying. But <laughs> but yeah, I wanted to make it so that you could see the words clearly, but also there was something like visually appealing and not just like a black and white web page because that's that's boring and we don't do boring around here. So yeah, you have to like kind of mentally visualize the site and you also need to be able to how should I say it? Make sure it doesn't, make sure it looks the way you, you want it to look. And don't do anything that you are not like, you don't, if you don't know if the website can do it, don't dream too hard about it. You can dream a little bit, but don't dream too hard. Because like, you know, like my book graphic, like the, the animated thing. Yeah, there's no way I think Wix can do that. So, you know, time to shelf that idea and do something else that's actually possible. So yeah, um, now we're going to move on to the zine itself. So there's an interesting overview that I made, which is that most of like, out of all the pieces, 16 of them were on the circuit breaker itself. So it's more of like what you did during the period of time when you were isolated at home, stuff like that. And six of the pieces were on the actual pandemic. So usually in the form of poetry, you'll be talking about the pandemic itself or personifying the pandemic as like a monster or someone who has come to lay waste to your country. Yeah, so now I'll be sharing my screen. So hopefully none of my friends text me strange things. Yeah, I'll share my screen and then we can look at the website together so that you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, hang on. Um, okay, do you see it? Like, wait, you guys unmuted. Can you unmute and tell me if you see it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we see it. Okay, thank you. So, uh, this is the Doskin Red website. As you can see, that's the red and white polka dot background that I mentioned earlier, courtesy of my friend Shalin, who I love very much. Um, this polka dot background might look simple, but it has five drafts, okay? I'm telling you, it's not that easy. Because Doskin, I mean, sorry, the Wix site stretches your wallpaper. So that's kind of strange. Anyways, when this is the fifth draft, and then when I saw it and it looked okay on the website, I think I cried. Not, not to be emotional and a baby, but it was touching. It was a real moment. Alright, so Doskin Red, we have 31 contributors, 42 submissions, 5 months, and 1 easy. Yay! Okay, so moving on. Uh, this is the cover, which is what I use for our promotional message. Um, drawn by Jolin again. Love that. So, um, what's Doskin Red? So, it's kind of what I already told you just now. This is who I am. And this is our list of contributors. Yay! Celebration noises. There's so many of you. I'm so proud. You know, honestly, I did not expect this much, this many submissions, but I am surprised and impressed. There's a lot of talent in this country. Okay, so um, how I did the website was that, so there's words, and in words, you can split to either poetry or prose. So let's look at poetry first. Right, so uh, the first poem is the one that I wrote because I figured that it would not need any more edits so I could put it at the top. Because if I edit anything in the center, right, for example, you add in one line, then I have to extend that part by one line and that means I have to move, like shift everything else below it down by another line. Yeah, so actually if you had like submitted a second draft to me, I had to edit yours, but I also had to shift everyone else down like a couple of notches. Yeah, so for example, this poetry page is super long. As you can see, it has a lot of submissions, which is great. But also if anyone in the middle wants to edit something, I have to edit the whole page. Yeah, so uh, are we talking about the various pieces in the zine now? So like, just look at what general themes people are interested in and how they decide to express themselves. So for mine, what happened was that I do not know how I can say this nicely, but during the circuit breaker period, while the coronavirus was raging on outside, people decided to write fan fiction about 
the coronavirus? Well, this can mean two things. One, they see the coronavirus as a person and they proceed to romance that person, which we will not be talking about today. That's also kind of strange. But secondly of all is they use the coronavirus as a sort of trope, like a context to which they can put their stories in. So what happens is that because uh, the coronavirus is happening and everyone has to kind of isolate themselves at home, the whole idea of the coronavirus tag on AO3, as mentioned in the poem, is that people basically uh, had a night together and then infected each other, and then they would have to then be quarantined together. And while they're quarantined together, usually it's the enemies to lovers trope where they hate each other, they hate the side of each other, they can't live with each other. Every single day they, they live with each other, like a volcano erupts. But then slowly but surely, they fall in love due to the increased proximity and whatnot hormones. And the second one is that they are strangers, but then they get quarantined together. Like, because they're housemates, maybe, who just never talk. But then because now they now have to talk to each other, they start to get close and therefore fall in love. So the coronavirus tag, I thought, was very interesting because it's a pandemic, it's pretty bad, but you're just out here romanticizing that. And honestly, I have mixed feelings on it because I don't know how to feel. Like the whole, oh, two people are locked in a room together thing. It's not like a new concept. But yeah, so I thought it was pretty interesting because it contrasted with the reality, which is the, on the very same day that I saw the coronavirus tag on AO3, 88 couples in China got a divorce the moment the quarantine got lifted. which is a yikes, which kind of shows you that sometimes when you write fiction, of course, like, since, especially since it's fan fiction, you're kind of just projecting, like, what you think would be good. But in reality, there are literally families who, because of the increased proximity and how they now have to deal, actually, like, talk to and deal with each other and try to coexist more peacefully, they split up. It's pretty shocking. So the first stanza is on um, the fan fiction, which is, I tried to combine as many tropes present in the fan fictions as possible, which means that yes, I read them out, but it was for research. For research. Yeah. Actually, I didn't even know most of the couples that they were writing about because I'm not very, I don't watch a lot of television shows, but I could glean here and there, you know, like, oh, this one's the emo one, and oh, this one's the happy one, that kind of thing. So yeah, um, some of the popular tropes in these pieces were going to the supermarket together to get supplies, holding toilet paper together, or something related to toilet paper. Um, one of them falls sick, and the other one has to nurse them. So for example, like, in the line, I say, Oh, maybe the treasure is chicken noodle soup. Yeah, because that's what that's usually what the the pieces would write about them eating when they were sick. And also what happens is that uh they fight a lot, but then afterwards they usually make up. So yeah, in the last <clears throat> part of the stanza I say, so the characters use proximity to atone and we write fan fiction to cope with the unknown. So we'll use the quarantine to feel less alone. So basically, because it's fan fiction, there are a lot of other people who also enjoy like perhaps the pairing that you're talking about. So since like you get attention online, you maybe might feel a bit less alone, which I think is pretty nice because you do feel alone and feeling alone sucks in simple words. And the next stanza is about more of the sad reality of what I think people might have faced. Because if you live together, firstly of all, there's like less space for the two of you because maybe perhaps both of you are working adults and usually you are at your office and you only come home to sleep. But now you actually have to live with each other. So perhaps you'll find out things about them they didn't even know and you realize that it, it grinds your gears and you, you just can't live with it. So um, things I included in the poem include like instigate toilet seat wars, which is basically that one classic occurrence where a couple gets together, they're in love, and then they realize one of them puts the toilet seat up and then they start a fight. 
Yeah, I know this because uh, I've seen this fight happen. The only solution here, in my opinion, is just to get two toilets, right? Otherwise, yeah, but this is not a luxury that some people might be able to afford, so they just end up fighting, which is pretty sad. And sometimes since, for example, let's say you have a fight, right? But you can't just storm out of the house angrily anymore. You have to just give them the cold shoulder while you're literally in the same room as them. And I don't know if, I feel like that is pretty complicated. Like how are you supposed to express your displeasure with someone when they are also visibly expressing their displeasure at you and you still have to eat dinner together? Like basically because of the close confines of the house and basically the quarantine in general, you kind of are forced to deal with the consequences, I would say, of like, maybe if you lashed out, you were being rude. You can't just go to sleep and pretend it never happened because the next morning, and you know this, you're going to wake up and have to see them again. So now you're forced with two choices, you're confronted with two choices. Either you apologize or you proceed to continue to let your pride inflate and just not apologize for the rest of circuit breaker which I put in the poem as well. Because sometimes, uh, oh, another idea that I put in is that sometimes if you, how should I say it? Let's say you see someone every day, it's possible that you start to run out of things to say. Whereas, um, for example, if the two of you are working at that semester before, maybe you only have to talk to each other on weekends, or like, so you have like, perhaps two hours worth of complaining about your office environment, but now you have to literally sit down and eat with them like seven days of the week. And you can't actually complain about them to them. Or you can just start a fight, which is what happened. So yeah, that's what I wrote. So the first one is more comedy based and the second one is more charring, you know, like that reality juxtaposed with fiction. Yes, writer's cramp. All right, so the next piece is by Divya. Um, I think, like, I texted her, but she didn't respond. But I, from what I think, I think her piece is mostly dealing with the theme of red. And it's actually really lovely. Like, please read her piece when you have the time. I love it a lot. And the next one is uh, Firefly Dreaming by Joelle Ko, who is actually someone that I don't know at all. But Joelle, if you're watching this, Thanks for writing in. I don't know who you are, but it's a good piece, you know? Yeah, um, he was from Twitter. He was also the only one to send me his poem in an image. So I just put the whole image in. If you want, if you want it in an image, go ahead. Like, yeah, which is why I said for this easy, I don't really have a lot of formatting or like, I don't really need to standardize anything. It's just like a, a, a giant hot pot steel, if you will, of things that people wrote. Uh, tempering isolation. This one is about the the pandemic and circuit breaker. Yeah, uh, it actually rhymes a lot, which I was very impressed by because rhyming is difficult. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's also really long, which which is I say. I admire that. Okay, next one is Minecraft at Four by Kwa. So uh, this one is, I think the context behind it was that she was playing Minecraft with her boyfriend, but um, she, she was playing for the first time, I think the persona is. So what happens is that the persona and the, the boyfriend speaker person, they kind of just talk to each other and one of them panics, but then things eventually are okay. Like, did I just lose you? It's kind of getting dark. I've always known this thing would be no walk in the park. Ooh, bars. But yeah, um, I think this font is really cute. And also uh, the font is in the Minecraft font. So yeah, there was really no kind of thing for everyone to adhere to in terms of font and formatting. It's just whatever, whatever floats your boat, I'll just put it in. Yeah. Um, this next one is This House by Zelda. Uh, this one's one of the pieces that was about love. Surprisingly, there weren't as many pieces on love as I expected. Most of them were about isolation, which is again, one of the theme words. So I'm not that surprised, but I thought genuinely that people would like write more about how 
oh, it's okay, Rekha, I can't see my significant other, but shockingly enough, not, not as much as I expected to see. So yeah, this one is about um, a relationship where the fire kind of has died down in the relationship. And yeah. It's good. Sorry, I know I have like, the only thing I say about these pieces is like, I love this piece, but it's genuinely true. I love all of these pieces. Otherwise, I wouldn't have put it inside. I would have told you to do editing or something. I don't know. I would, I would have put it inside, yeah. Um, next one is Isolated Dots by Elliot. Actually, Elliot submitted a lot of pieces, like one, two, three, four. So kudos to you, Elliot. I don't know if you're watching this, but if you're watching this, I'm, I am very impressed because that's a lot of poetry. Anyways, um, most of his pieces, I think, were about the pandemic itself. So there are lines like those who offer themselves as lambs for the slaughter. Yeah. I think, if I'm not wrong, this one is about people, it's either about frontliners who are trying to sacrifice, like, who mildly sacrifice themselves for, you know, to, like, cure the people who are sick, or it's about people who disrespect circuit breaker rules and meet their friends, even though the rules say no gathering. Hmm. By the way, can I just say in NPU, like, I was, I live in dorm right now, as you can see, and when I was at the canteen, people were literally gathering in groups of eight. It was really sad. I was like, please, I, I want to live. I don't want to die. But yeah, they were next to me. So that's what I can do. Um, other than move away. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And this idea of people gathering and not supposed to is in another piece, but we'll look at that later. Yes. Okay. Uh, the next one is Portrait of a Lady Quarantine by Austin. I actually really like this one. I think it's one of his best poems. Actually, no, it's the best one. Yeah. Um, this one is about how this lady is kind of like looking out through the mirror. I mean, the window. And whatever she sees are like the happenings of what's outside, but she's trapped in her own room. Yeah. Oh, and the next one is Small Parties by Ryan. Yay! Ryan, you're watching this. Hello. Okay, so um, this poem is about how we are all kind of trapped in a small party and there's like not really a lot of privacy here. Like, basically, the context is that this is a quote from The Great Gatsby. Uh, the character Jordan Baker in the book says that she really likes large parties because they are very intimate. The line is interesting because you would expect a small party to be intimate since there's not much people that are around. Like you can't just drift from one group of people to another. But she says that she likes large parties for their intimacy, which is interesting. So the idea explored in this piece is that since we are all gathered at home, we are in essence being forced to take part in small parties in a way. Since like the only people that we interact with are um, perhaps our family members and whoever is in the house in general. So the thing is that because everyone is forced together in such small places, spaces, and like the party is small, it actually results in there not being a lot of intimacy. And instead, everyone is just kind of bumping against each other's shoulders when they're trying to go to the toilet or use the kitchen or, you know, having to share a space together. So it's actually less intimate in a small party because perhaps you just kind of get you can't just get to know one person and then move on you have to like you are just forced in general to be with them and like interact with them and even if they're saying something that you don't agree with or you're busy but they're talking to you you can't just leave the way you can in a large party where if you stay it's because you choose to stay but in a small party or like in quarantine, you, you have to stay. Like there's no choice for you to leave or to go and interact with someone who you might click better with maybe. Yeah, hang on, I'm just getting this one. Yeah, so um, 
call your friends, but they cannot distract you from peripheral vision or keep you apart from bitter warmth. Not too sure about this line, but it's possible that by peripheral vision, it might mean the concept of how you kind of compare yourself to other people. Like, I know this happened a lot during Circuit Breaker because I also compare myself to others. I'll be like, oh, this person's making so much art. Why am I not as productive? Or I'll be like, oh, this person is doing something that I admire and they're actually doing something despite the current circumstance, which I respect. And I wish I could do the same. Yeah. Or perhaps they would be like, oh, one thing is that during the circuit breaker season, everyone was on Skype or Discord or Zoom calls with their friends. But I don't really have any like large friend groups. So peripheral vision for me here would be when I see people getting together, but I don't really have anyone to get together with because all my friends are like kind of one-on-one. -on -one. I don't really have a large clique. Yeah. And also when people send food to each other because I have no credit card, so I can't do that. Yeah. So the next one is names by Isabel. Um, it's about the coronavirus and it has a lot of like red imagery, the bonfire, the flames. Yeah. The long dress. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, because I I looked at these pieces, but then I I asked some of you like, oh, what was the thought process that went into what you made? And for this one, I think what she wanted was that she kind of personifies the coronavirus as like some entity that is always there with her. Yeah, which is something that I think we can all relate to because during a circuit breaker season, whether you want it or not, news is going to fly into your ears. It's basically everywhere. You have to take precautions. You're always reminded that there's something dangerous out there. Yeah. Okay, the Song of Mina by Ing Yao. Okay, so this one is a reflection on how pandemic restrictions have made us recognize and cherish our freedom. So there was a time when we feared nothing can wake this city for this number. It's kind of like, oh, before the circuit breaker period, we didn't really appreciate how we could all just go out freely and experience things. The same way when you have a blocked nose, you start to realize that you weren't really appreciating having unblocked breathing. I got you. Yeah, so, um, Phil the miner will keep calling, how full of intention to sell you not insurance, but a humbling reminder of the homely sounds we chose to hear annoyance in. So, because now um, everything is kind of more compressed, I would say, like there's a general sense of claustrophobia, I feel, in most of the pieces that talk about the pandemic or circuit breaker. But yeah, um, here's the thing, when you go out to hike, and you hear bird noises, you're like, yes, this is truly like what I came here for, the vibes are right. But then when you hear bird noises when you're at home, you feel really annoyed. You're like, please stop calling. I'm trying to focus on whatever it is that I'm doing. So like the difference in attitude because like of the confined space that you're in, we hear annoyance in the bird call even though it's always been there. But now that you're at home every day and you start to, you have to pay more attention to your surroundings because that's the only thing that you have. You start to feel annoyed in what has always been there. Yeah. So example, like back to the toilet seat example, maybe a significant other has always been doing this, but now that you're more aware of it, it starts to grind on your gears. Grind your gears, yes. The next one is To Grow a Garden, also by Ing Yao. And if you read this piece and you have no idea what is going on, it is okay. That is intentional, according to him. Uh, the piece is really long. I almost, I was actually super impressed. I was like, nine entire stanzas. And also, I usually write really long poems, like two A4 pages worth. So I saw this and I was like, ooh, a long poem, comrade. Anyway, so The Sound of Mina is about, it's a, ref I mean, sorry. Uh, to Grow a Garden is about, it's basically a story, not really more of a theme. The plot here, if you could call it a plot, is that there's a lonely persona living in a dilapidated hut atop a hill. And this hill is one of many other hills. And there's a mysterious wandering spirit seeker that is trying to find the cemetery. 
But the cemetery is not on this hill that the protagonist is on, it's on another hill. But the persona himself doesn't know that the cemetery exists. So one person is trying to find the cemetery, but the one who lives there doesn't know about the cemetery. So the wanderer keeps searching for the wrong hill, and it angers all the unappeased spirits who are living on that hill, who take their revenge by magically destroying the backyard of the hut that the persona is living in. So the persona is trying to grapple with what is going on. If this plot sounds confusing to you, it's, it's okay. It, it's just meant to be that way. And I think like the feeling of like confusion is also something that is quite, it was like very strong during the period of time where we literally couldn't like really leave our house. Like now we are, we are allowed to get in groups of five like and go out. But earlier on, um, the feeling of confusion was quite palpable. There was a lot of fake news spread online and it was, it was quite confusing because you really don't know what to believe and also, if you choose to believe the wrong thing, you might be taking risks that you don't want to take. Yeah. Um, another reason to get better sleep by Jedrick. Okay, so this poem is also another really long one, but it's basically about um, his circuit breaker, the speaker's circuit breaker experience, where uh, he's kind of, it's 3 a.m. and he is having like, it's like, this is just the speaker's train of thought where, you know, you're at 3 a.m. You start to think about existential crisis and your inevitable death and capitalism. So this poem is kind of just like that. And uh, yeah, so at the end part, a time concludes the disenchanted hangman takes a bow having made his visit. So the disenchanted hangman, it, it can be either the speaker or the cynical thoughts that the speaker has personified as a hanged man, like someone who has given up hope. And after, it takes a while having made his visit. It's kind of like every time it's late at night, you find yourself kind of worrying about the future. Like, I know that when it's like at midnight, I start thinking about whether I have a job. Yeah. Okay, Pestilence by Aidan Ong. Um, this one is also about the coronavirus. Except that uh, this one has a lot of scientific references. So if you're a STEM kid, I recommend that you read this. I'm not that knowledgeable about the references that he put inside, although he did explain some to me. But um, to my to my deep uh, disappointment, like in myself, like, I I get it, but then like when I blink, I kind of lose it again. But I'm sure if you read it, you'll understand it yourself. It's not too difficult to understand, I think. So, uh, in the last thing, so it says, this plague has been an unwelcome intrusion, yet it shall, like this tale, have a fitting conclusion. So what happens is that sooner or later, right, the speaker in this poem thinks that this plague will end, which is actually quite an optimistic take on the situation because a lot of other pieces kind of touch on the idea that we don't know when it's going to end, but this one says that even if we don't know how it's going to end, it will end. But how it ends is just something that is up to us, whether we decide to cope with wisdom and we do like, we take precautions and such, or if we try to like deny that the whole thing exists, then of course that will be a much worse conclusion to the story. Okay, the next one is Ghost Story by Ace. Ha <laughs> ha. Hi. Um, yeah, so this poem is about him jogging. And uh, the idea of the ghost story is touched on in the third stanza, which is, last night there was someone seated at the bus stop. He was eating out of a styrofoam box and looked up at me as I ran past. And then the last stanza says, I make it a point not to speak to ghosts. So the idea of this ghost story is that there are two takes on it. One, um, the person eating out of a styrofoam box belongs to someone of perhaps a lower class. And when you feed up, and try to avoid eye contact as you run past. It's kind of like your privilege where you can just ignore like things like inequality and poverty, or like when you feel perhaps threatened by the fact that people may not be having like as good of a life as you and your conscience gets pricked, so you just instinctively avoid it. But it could also be a literal ghost. 
So whether it's a real person or not, it's up to the reader to decide. And the last one is to be positive by Anna, because I figured we should, it was very funny to me because the title said to be positive, but then in my opinion, this thing actually references more of like, what if you test up positive for COVID-19, which is ironic and I love that. So yeah, and the last part is this, is losing count a sign of recovery or a symptom of numbness. So when you get used to the daily routine of not knowing when you can go back out, outdoors again or meet with your friends, are you like coping with it or are you just becoming desensitized to it? So that's another idea that we can think about. Okay, now I have to start going faster because I have 15 minutes left. So if I don't say a lot or I skip some pieces, please forgive me. Yeah, so uh, In This Loneliness We Strive by Kelly is about um, the speaker's experience when she, this is just like her train of thought as she stays at home. Some of the ideas that are here are, um, here it says, this time around I will work harder. I've been gifted time at the expense of everyone I love and of this space that has raised me and has given me a place to grow up safely. I've been gifted time to do things greater than myself. I think this is a common sentiment among Singaporean people who are so used to the rat race. Like I saw this article in the news that said that Singaporean people have really bad work-life balance to the point where when we take a break from work, we feel bad about it. We're like, oh yeah, this is the weekend, but instead of maybe doing something productive, like doing work or like staying over time or actually like learning something new perhaps, they start to feel guilty about like maybe sleeping in or meeting their friends or family because they think that it could be a waste of their time because they should be doing something else. Which I thought is really sad. Like time you enjoy wasting is not wasted time. And it's okay to relax once in a while. And I think especially for Singaporeans, it's okay to relax a lot more. Especially when I was studying for the A levels, the the entire psychology of, oh yeah, I wake up at 8 a.m. and then I sleep at 9 p.m. and then, oh wait, no, they, they do work from 8 to 9 and then they sleep at 11. I feel like that just encourages burnout because when you don't relax and your body doesn't rest, it's always in constant like activity and anxiety. It starts to wear you down and after a while you start to feel like what you do is never enough, which is something I'm very familiar with because I mean, you know, you study literature, there's just never enough. Like, you, there's always some new idea about peace that you haven't thought of yet. And it's kind of impossible to cover, like, every single base because there are so many scholars out there writing about the same text that you are doing on. And you can never, like, read through or know all of their viewpoints. So after a certain period of time, you need to learn that it's okay to just relax. Like, during the circuit breaker period, I know people were feeling very guilty about not being productive, which is something I felt also, but I really think it's okay. Like it's a pandemic, you are allowed to cope with relaxing or doing what makes you happy. Yeah. The next one is about introspection, impulsivity, and idling and isolation by Nan Lin. Um, yeah, so the main idea of this piece is kind of like, uh, my identity crisis. So with the countless number of hours spent idling at home, this has allowed me to ponder over my own identity. Where, and then two paragraphs later, she says, I know I'm extremely fortunate to be able to have a roof over my head and so on. So in this case, I think it's a very common sentiment where we're like, yeah, I'm having it really good right now. Like I don't have to worry about whether I still have a job because I mean, we're students and I don't have to worry about whether there'll be food on the table or not. But yet, I'm feeling all these negative emotions like stress and anxiety. And you don't feel valid. Like, you're, you don't feel like these feelings are valid because there are other people having it so much worse than you. I think that, I mean, it's your emotions, like, you're valid for having them. Like, it's not your fault that there's a pandemic going on and that you're worried about it. I think that's just a human response to have. Even if you're not directly put in the line of danger, the knowledge that there's something dangerous out there is quite like and to be afraid of it is quite normal like 
for example, I told you there was a bear outside and there were people fighting the bear. Will you not worry about whether the bear will like somehow slip past and attack you? It's pretty normal, right? Just replace the bear with the virus, kind of. But also, um, it's normal to feel lonely. Like a lot of people felt lonely because they couldn't, they couldn't meet their friends anymore. And I think even more so that they couldn't meet them even if they wanted to. Like sometimes there are a lot of people um, who like just cancel plans. Like they don't plan to meet up with people or they're perfectly fine being alone, for example. But when you don't have a choice anymore, like the choice is stripped away from you, you start to feel a lot more confined and constricted because it's not, now it's no longer whether you want to or not, it's that you can't even if you want to and sometimes that just makes you want to even more. Yeah, um, always check your mirror for gateways to hell, especially during CD by Waylin. I really love this piece, I, read. I think it's my favorite post piece, but it's really long, so I'm just going to skip through most of it. Uh, it's a story that basically follows how this person during circuit breaker in her room, like her double crawls out through a mirror, and then how this person like interacts with this double person. I don't want to spoil it, but it's very interesting. Like, please read it. Please. I will personally text all of you to read it if I could. Yeah. Um, and the next one is where I lived and what I lived for by Ace again. So <laughs> this one is about the speaker has a money plan in his room. And then it's kind of just like his reflections on what to do about it because like it wasn't his choice that the money plan was put in his room, but he now has to deal with it. Yeah. Sorry, I'm like moving on faster. Okay, so the next one is uh, images. So we have art. So this is the cover image that I talked about. This one is National Language Class. It's an anonymous submission, but in case you don't realize, the whole thing is painted. Like I actually thought there was some kind of digital manipulation and the rest of the whole thing was painted and I was really shook. Like it just blows my mind that someone actually took the effort to paint something for this easy. Like you're not getting paid to do it, like it's free, but you did it anyway and that, that makes me happy. Yeah, uh, this is a study of another painting. I'm so sorry that I'm, I don't know what the painting is called, but yeah, it was also about lessons. So now this is a lesson again, but now in like a Zoom format with a chat and everything. Uh, the next one is Day, Infinity and Counting by Audrey. So the, why can't I see? Yes. So this artwork is kind of about how like, Oh yeah, most of the artworks kind of dealt with the idea of like the claustrophobia with the confined space and you don't know how long you're going to be in there for. Whereas I think most of the poetry kind of dealt with the idea that you are, you feel very like lonely or you're having a lot of like anxious thoughts about the pandemic itself. This one is more of like the space one and that one is more of like the time, like you don't know how long this is going to take. Which I thought was very interesting. Maybe because it's easier to portray space in art, perhaps. I'm just guessing. Yeah, so um, here there are a lot of like interesting elements. These are all things from the artist's own life. So there's like a toilet roll behind the person's head. And um, the number of hours thing is basically the idea is that it's a lot harder to comprehend hours instead of days. So when it's hard to comprehend hours, right, you kind of lose track of time. You don't know how much longer this is going to last or you don't know how long you've been in a current state. Like the, the, the flow of time kind of starts to warp itself. And I felt this very strongly because my sleep schedule was completely like just, okay, it wasn't completely gone, but I woke up at 2 p.m. every day. So I think that says a lot. But basically you kind of lose track of time because every day kind of is the same. Like for example, when you go to school, it fixes a routine for you. But then because uh, I just graduated, so I didn't have school, thankfully. It was a lot harder to kind of like control your time wisely. Yeah. The next one is Siren by Rachel. It's also really nice. This kind of reminds me of like a snow globe. Except I guess if you shake it, everything goes haywire. But yeah, there's like an on off switch. So I think it's more of like a desk lamp. And this person is basically feeling very claustrophobic amongst all the buildings which is the whole idea of you are trapped in a space that you can't really leave because it's not safe for you to do so. Yeah. 
can just depot, 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 road by car. It's actually a painting. I know, I was pretty shook too. Sometimes people send me things and I'm like, oh, nice photograph. Like, I actually thought it was a photograph. I told her, I was like, oh, nice photograph. She was like, it's a painting. And I was like, I was shook. But yeah, thank goodness I said that because I don't want to classify this wrongly. But it's a really good piece. Especially because I think art that looks like photographs are cool. And photographs that look like art are cool. Yeah, um, this is Snake in a Red Boot by uh, Mr. Chang. And this is Four Feet Apart by Edison. Um, for this piece, uh, the piece is about, hang on. Okay, so the context behind this piece is that it's the final meetup that the artist had with their friend right before Circuit Breaker hit them. So uh, this is the artist and this is the friend. And it was the last face-to-face -face interaction with a friend that she had and it left an impression on her. So what happened was that this was quite like a nice meetup. They sat under the stars, they talked about their worries and the virus, and they distracted themselves with cartoons and songs, something that we can all relate to. And they did all this while they set like social distance, like they sat apart from each other. So she thought it was quite an interesting picture. Yeah. And this is Sue Sayer by Joan. Yeah. I would comment more on this, but I think this is a character that I am not very confident on talking about, so I will just move on to the next one. Okay, photography. This is The Last Potluck by Charmaine. I really like this one, by the way. I think it's super funny. This is also a parody of The Last Supper, except now it's a potluck, which is something that we're not really allowed to do anymore since we can't meet people and we can't share food. I mean, it's not advised to. Yeah. So nice. <laughs> And the next one is a collection of public seats and benches by Koa. So these are all um, benches and public spaces that have marks on them to demarcate how you should sit in order to social distance. Oh, there's this Instagram account that takes photos of cats who disregard social distancing measures. Have you all seen it? It's just photos of cats sitting on like the X mark or like they're just not social distancing. And it's really funny. Like I don't know why, but it just, it gives me dopamine. And uh, this is like a photo that I sent in called Sadness Noise. Uh, let's just skip it. Yeah. <laughs> wait, no, I missed out. GIFs. Okay, okay, wait. Yes, I'm super, I love it when people send in GIFs because this is the one thing you can't print on paper. So especially on an online form, I want to appreciate <clears throat> these more. So this is Stay Home by Nicole. Um, The laptop, like, flashes and basically this person is kind of like levitating in space in her room. Uh, obviously this is not possible but it's really cool because it shows you that you know just in the, the, the idea of confinement again. Oh I have two minutes. Okay okay. This is Haha ha, Don't Die You're So Sexy by Heidi. Yes. Um, again the idea of red I think it's a lot it's very prominent in most of the artworks because it's easier to just, you know, use a color rather than try to personify a color, maybe. But also, it's a, it's just like, you know, a direction that you can start brainstorming with that's quite easy to adopt. This is Work From Home by Alison. So this one is about how, um, let me see. Yeah, so working on home, because you're working at home, you know, sometimes you don't, I'm not saying I don't pay attention in Zoom calls, but Occasionally, when I do dine to not pay attention in my Zoom calls, you spend time like scrolling through maybe social media, like with your phone, like you know, like this, and you're just like, mm hmm, but I, like you're like scrolling. Yeah, so working at spending time at your home working remotely gave the artist more time to do like doom scrolling, which is where like you look through headlines of like bad news and you just feel worse. It's like this spiral that perpetuates because you're like, Oh, this thing is happening. This is very terrible. Now I feel absolutely terrible, but I need to know more. I need to know more. And then the more you know, the worse it makes you feel. So she wanted to reflect the anxiety that she felt when she was looking at all the headlines about the virus. Yeah. Yes, sounds. Okay, so this is another fun part. So my friend Marcus actually made a song called Empty Planet. I won't play it because I don't know how audio works on Zoom, but you should definitely give it a listen. It's really good. And this is Far Away by Charmaine. So she actually like made a song and she sang it. 
and the lyrics are also here. It's one of like, I would say it's perhaps the most optimistic piece in this entire collection. Everyone else is just like, I feel so alone and there's no space in here, I can't breathe, but she's like, diving. Anyways, very lovely. Um, so it says, far away, you way across the planet, all alone, just happy that we tried. So this is basically about um, how like there's a couple in the song and they might be far away, but they're still close together, which is really cute. See guys, you can be optimistic if you want to. Instead, instead all of you are just like, they're all gonna die. And it's like the, the, that one meme of the dog sitting in a fire where he's like, this is fine and everything is on fire. Yeah. Um, so the last section, oh, I overshot, okay, multimedia. So this section is basically just um, artworks, but they have poetry in them. So because there are two mediums, I just kind of put them under multimedia together. So this one is The Lovers by Chichin and the previous anonymous from the Zoom call teaching artwork. So it says, please don't break my heart, pretending to feel your lips at six feet apart. This is actually also, I think, a reference to some other other artwork. Yeah, okay, no, the, it's very interesting because the person that just texted me that you saw just now, it's the person who like did this. I was asking her for like what she wanted to say about it, but like, yeah, she, as you can see, she said that she has nothing to say. So we're just gonna move on since I overran anyway. Okay, the last one, outside the party carries on by Kyran. So here you have a photo, you have art and you have words. I really love this one. Also because I love Tyron, but yeah. So interestingly enough, this one also like references The Great Gatsby. So that's two pieces that reference The Great Gatsby in this entire zine. It's something that I wasn't expecting, of course. So um, the thing is that here, wait. Oh wait, no, okay, this one doesn't re reference The Great Gatsby. It's just that I thought it reminded me of it when I saw it because I'm so sorry, but like, you know my associative mind, yeah. So when I saw yellow, I immediately thought of like get like the yellow car in the accident. Yeah, I'm so sorry. This is my bad, my bad, my mistake. But yeah, it's really interesting. Um the meeting table remains empty, but they are no less guilty with their clammy hands in hand, huddled beneath to hide from view. I think um she didn't really want to she said that it's up to my personal interpretation. So my personal interpretation of this piece is that it's about how the there are circuit breaker rules, right? So for example, the photograph in the center shows you that you're not really allowed to gather in groups anymore. But when people are not looking, people still gather anyway, which is quite irresponsible. But yeah, which is why this the last line is the cops of a city you ran over. Because it shows how people only follow the rules when they are forced to like when they are being watched and like they're kind of forced to like follow the rules, but like, if no one is looking, people, and they think they won't get caught, people tend to not follow the rules. So you have a lot of instances of people flouting circuit breaker, like that one guy who went to eat bakute. Yeah, okay, so uh, that's all for today, but I'm just gonna close off with this Instagram post that I like very much. Hang on, let me, let me find it. Okay, so it's a really long post, so I'll just read it out really quickly. If uh, you don't, if you kind of miss a certain part, you can let me know and I'll send it to you. Physically stopping in my tracks in the middle of my midday walk because I took two hits, saw a flower, and realized that gods can't love the way humans can because love is about survival. Then the person says, okay, I was told what I said, I, what I was supposed to say was that an immortal could never love the way a mortal can because the reason we love so viscerally is because of our own mortality. We're both vulnerable and scared and difficult to understand and we only manage to get more so as we age. We need people to love us from the moment that we're born or we won't make it. We are constantly trying to understand each other, to love more and love harder because otherwise we'll die. Everything is fake but love. Love is the root of everything. Take away capitalism and tear down the skyscrapers and throw away the internet and, and stuff. You will still wake up tomorrow and need to eat and you will still need someone to care for you when you're sick and we'll still need music and entertainment and connection to each other. And what will prompt anyone to do anything if not for the shared need to survive as a species 
and they feel some form of being needed in the whole, of being accepted and protected by others. I don't know how you guys see it, but the way we instinctively need to understand each other down to our basic survival instincts, that's pretty metal. And then another person added on and said, I think that similarly of this vein of thinking, love is tested by our struggle for survival. You ever need to get your friend home, but she has no money to get there? You give up your paltry living space to fit her in that night, or spend the money you're trying to save on so she gets a ride straight home. You get a phone call from your sibling and they're in trouble again at the most inconvenient time. It's dangerous and it's dark, but there are no rides outside this time of night. So you pull on your boots and your hot ass at 2 a.m. in the night to get to where they are because you'd rather be in danger than have them remain in danger. You ever give up your food so your family can have some? You ever let your body hit the floor first when you both fall so that your loved one's head is cushioned? You ever make the painful decision between survival and love because you can't not love the people you do and it means eating less or being in a dangerous situation or sacrificing money that week or being torn to shreds by judges and whatnot? I feel like love isn't proven until you know how you behave in hardship. If it still exists within difficulty, then that is love. So basically the idea of this piece and why I end off with this is that I think in this, like, because Dosker Ray was created during the circuit breaker period, I think the circuit breaker period actually tests love or like the connections in general that you have with other people. So I just want to end off with that. During like the circuit breaker period, it's okay to feel lonely because I think everyone is generally feeling lonely. But if you don't like bother to reach out to people perhaps, and then you feel like sad, then you need to know that it's okay for you to reach out. Like people won't find you annoying if you text them and ask them how their day is. Like if you really need like that kind of maybe attention or like connection, you can make an effort to maintain it. Like it's okay. Like you don't necessarily have to wait for people to text you and then get sad when they don't. Like sometimes I do that too, but then I remember that Oh right, it's a two-way street. I should just text them instead if I'm lonely. And I think that's just a reminder that we can have. All right, so that's the end. Yay. <laughs> uh, any questions? I know like this took seven minutes more than I expected, but yeah, any questions? <laughs> Okay, I guess not. Um, yeah, how do I end the 